This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Okay, we're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel. This is still Think Tech, yeah? On a given Monday. And this is Life in the Law, one of our favorite programs. And today we're going to talk about the role of the United States Attorney in everything, and in our country, in our world. You know? And the tagline for that is representing the United States in all civil and criminal cases. There's a burden. I'll tell you, when I was in the service, this Florence Nakakuni I'm talking to, she's Hi. a former United States Attorney. And she's here to tell us about those things. When I was in the service uh, doing court martials, I would be asked to stand up and appear. And I would get up and say, this is something you did every day, I would get up and say, my name is Jay Fidel, and I represent the United States of America. It never failed to put a tingle down my spine every time I said that. Oh, I, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. How'd you get into that? Well, uh, I was at the office for 32 years, the first 24 and a half as an assistant U.S. attorney or an AUSA, and the last seven and a half as the U.S. attorney. And I got into it actually not planning to. Um, in fact, uh, my colleagues and fellow students at the law school will tell you that I was the absolute last person who would be doing <laughs> litigation or criminal work of any kind. Um, but. Uh, when I was in Washington, D.C., working for the Justice D Department doing civil cases, there came a time when I wanted to come home. So I wrote to Dan Bent, the then U.S. attorney, and uh, he actually told me, I can't hire you. You know, I need people who can pick up a criminal file and run with it, and you can't, because you've never done a criminal case. You haven't done a trial, all of which is true. Yeah. And I thought, okay. Uh, but he told me that he'd want to hire me in about... Um, 18 months, and I thought, right, but he did. So He waited for you to develop that experience. Eh? Well, not really, because then I was at the Navy, in the Navy Officer General Counsel's office doing civil work, yeah. but he was building the office, so he needed more experienced people, yeah. and by waiting a year and a half, or almost two years later, yeah. he had enough experienced people so he could pick up someone like me with zero criminal or trial experience. And it worked swell, didn't it? It did, I was lucky. <laughs> you were born for it. So what does it take to be a United States attorney? I just need to ask you that. I, I keep thinking it's something around Elliot Ness. Oh, well, um, but it's more than just Elliot Ness, right? Uh, the U.S. attorney has to, um, is in charge of all criminal cases in his or her jurisdiction, and also the civil cases in which the U.S. is a party. Uh, but there's more to that because it's a presidentially appointed position. Uh. And it's someone who is looked to by the community. So there, there, there are things that a U.S. attorney should do and does, which is being in the community and working with the community to uh, build bridges and to strengthen that bond between all of law enforcement and the community. Yeah, you know, to me, uh, you know, most people don't have much contact with you. United States Attorney, and that's probably okay. That's good. It's okay, but but you have to know what the U.S. Attorney is doing, right? And you have to know how that relates to your life, even if indirect. So what you know, what should people think of when they think of the United States Attorney? How the United States Attorney is keeping our country, you know, stable and strong, the rule of law. I mean, w what is the process? What is what is the daily grind that that relates to me? Okay, so. The vast majority of a U.S. attorney's work is criminal, and that's just how it is. Uh, so when I was a U.S. attorney, roughly 80% of the resources, uh, resources of the office were in criminal, the remainder in civil. Uh, and in the criminal work, you got your ref cases referred from other federal agencies, sometimes state and locals. And you wanted to make sure that once the case was assigned to an assistant U.S. attorney to actually handle the case, that it was a coordinated and appropriate approach to how to get the ch case charged, if at all. Not every case that's referred to us gets charged. Because the United States Attorney makes a decision as to whether to prosecute on a given case. Yes. This is, this is very important and powerful. It is. And, and these cases are sometimes huge. We'll talk about some of them. High profile cases that affect the security of the United States. It's not, this isn't burglary. This is no. other kinds of crimes you know, federal crimes in federal statutes. What kind of crimes 
are we talking about? Well, mention, you know, now that you mentioned the national security type cases, uh, one case that went to trial while I was still U.S. attorney was the Gawadia case. Um, so Nosha Gawadia uh, was a contractor to the federal government, and he was charged with espionage. And Ken Sorensen of the office tried that case. It was a lengthy trial, several months, uh, but justice was done. And Mr. Gawadia was sentenced to 30 years in prison. And most recently, Jay, he sued me, just me, uh, not Ken Sorensen, because he didn't sign the letters. Wow, that's uh, ridiculous. Yes. Uh, and so I was represented by an assistant U.S. attorney in Denver, because Mr. Gawadia is in prison in Denver. And the case just got dismissed last week. What was I'm the nature of that suit? What could that be for? Well, um, it's an admin uh it's an, uh, of an administrative nature. And, and he uh, wanted condition. relief from you because you yes. were the United States Attorney. Yes. You know, I, I was going to be on the jury of that case. I don't were know you I really? Told you that before, yeah. No, I didn't know that. Yeah, I don't think you would have made it. Judge Helen Gilmore, right. <laughs> judge Helen Gilmore was a judge. And the system in the federal courts, I'm sure you're exquisitely familiar with this, is you get a call the night before to say whether you should come down or not come down. And the, the case was continued. Otherwise, I would have been down there, at least in the pool, and potentially uh, on the jury, although I agree with you. If, when they realized that I was a lawyer and all this, uh, and, and former Coast Guard prosecutor, yes. they, they would not, and judge in the Coast Guard, I don't think they would have let me stay. But I was looking forward. I didn't care how long it took. I wanted to do my duty on that one. Three months. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a remarkable case, too, because Ken Sorensen, the prosecutor, and, and you were the assigning U.S. attorney at the time? No, actually, the case had been in the office for so long yeah. that um, the case was already assigned to Ken uh, when I became U.S. attorney. But I was in the office when the case came in, and it was one of these um, cases that took a long time to develop. Yes. Because of its complexity. Yes. And all the classified information. And after the case was done, and uh, Guadia was his name, was in, you know convicted and sentenced and incarcerated in Colorado, whatever, um, the Department of Justice gave permission to Ken Sorensen to come in our think tech show. Yes, and I know And if you that. guys are interested in hearing what he had to say about being a prosecutor in that case, it's on our think tech channel, and it is a fabulous interview. Well, it is. I mean, he knows that case inside out, and to this day, I think, um, and certainly throughout the time I was there, uh, he, was, he would be asked by the FBI to speak to groups about how that case was investigated, because it uh, was... Um, very difficult to say yeah. the least but very yeah. interesting fascinating stuff yeah. Yeah. you know you had all the the classified information you had all the technical information uh that you really you almost had to be an engineer to understand but ken ultimately did yeah that was it was an incredible case uh, uh, too bad i couldn't serve on that jury um you know the, but the whole notion there was uh, this was espionage going on right here in Hawaii. Right. There's an espionage case. I mean, I, I don't know if you have a lot of espionage cases in the, uh, you know, District of Hawaii uh, U.S. Attorney's Office, do you? Uh, not a lot, but um, there is uh, at least one pending right now that's been in the news. It hasn't been in the news lately. Um, uh, Mr. Kang, an enlisted man, and I believe it's espionage charges, but I haven't heard about it or seen anything about it in some months. So the idea is this is that... The, the cases the U.S. attorney takes on the criminal side are really different than the, the cases you hear about in the state court. Uh, they, are, they are national in interest, and they are, um, they are always federal statutes and, and, and at, a, may I say, a high level of crime, because these are federal crimes. Right. Uh, and if it's in federal court, typically it's multi-defendant, multi-jurisdiction, meaning multi-states are involved, and frequently these days... Defendants of every stripe uh, use technology. Ah. You'd be surprised. Ah, sure. sure. So, so do the law enforcement, but um, the, the bad guys use it also. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> For example, uh, the, I know the Secret Service does a credit card fraud investigation. They do that, uh, and they would they would refer a case to the United States Attorney <clears throat> in order to chase somebody who was doing credit card fraud, and certainly that's in national or international, certainly interstate commerce uh, or international crime. So that must be very technical, hard to prove, involves all kinds of internet issues, uh, whatnot. I mean, gee, you know, and I would say, just, just thinking about it with you today, Flo, I would say this is going to increase going forward. It's going to be more complex. Yes. 
Yes, and I think more people are reporting these things. And unfortunately, a lot of times, agents can't do anything when they're told, look, um, somebody I know got a call from somebody and they sent $10,000 to this number. Oh, you know, it's hard to do anything with that. Sure. But we encourage people to report it because after a while, the law enforcement agents assigned to the case might see a pattern something might come up later. So that's important, but you know we're so connected to each other. And uh, yes, you're right, we're seeing more of it, and I think we're gonna see more of it. Yeah. In terms of connection, <clears throat> I would imagine that the Office of the United States Attorney here in Hawaii is in regular contact with the Department of Justice in Washington, with other U.S. attorneys elsewhere, and for that matter, with state law enforcement, am yes. I right? Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you know, information, data, what have you, um, policies, uh, other cases that will interpret the statutes you're trying to enforce, all those things. You, you're not isolated in any way. No, not at all. In fact, um, I would have to say that most of the criminal cases that the U.S. Attorney's Office does will almost invariably involve a state or local agency, and most times that would be the police department in the county in which the crime occurred. So. Honolulu County, Oahu being the largest county in terms of population, most of the cases uh, occur here. And so most of those cases also involve the Honolulu Police Department. Yeah. So, I, I, you know, as I have a million questions, we'll never finish on time. So what about the juries? A jury in the federal system, you know, that you are arguing in front of as the prosecutor, um, is different than a state jury. Well, well because... Or is it the same? Well, it's different in the sense that we can... The pool comes from the entire state. But always, of course, the majority, the vast majority of the people on your jury will be people from Honolulu, or from Oahu, rather. And the people from the neighbor islands have to commute. You know, they, the court has to end at a certain time, say 4.30, 4.15, because they need to take a plane to go home. What would you say, there's, there's camera, camera one over there, what would you say to somebody who gets a notice asking him or her, to appear as a juror in a federal case? Please appear and do your civic duty. There are very few things that the government asks you to do, and one of them is to serve as a jury if you're a citizen. Yeah. And I strongly encourage that. You know, I have uh, friends, family members who get a summons, um, and uh, they ask me, how can I get out of this? You know, if I say that I know you, will I get out of this? <laughs> <laughs> that's not going to work. No, that's not going to work. You know, you, you should serve, unless for some reason, you know, um, a peremptory is exercised and, you know, you're off. It's, it's, or, or there's a cause. In, in my view, it's a more interesting possibility of a case anyway in the federal system. <laughs> yeah, I, well, that's a system I'm most familiar with. Yeah, yeah. Um, we're going to take a short break, though. Okay. We'll come back, and I'll talk about some of the civil practice in the ah, United States right. Attorney's Office. And I also want to talk about how it's changed in this administration right now this year. Okay. We'll be right back with Flo Nakakuni. We have this crazy thing going on today. I was just walking by, and all these DJs and producers are set up all around the city. I just walked by, and I said, what's happening, guys? They told me they were making music. So we do it. Oh, we have so many questions for Florence Nakakuni, the former United States Attorney for the District of Hawaii. So let's turn to civil for a minute. Though. All right. Um, you know, the thing is that uh, in, in civil trials, uh, the government doesn't necessarily appear in a lot of civil trials. Uh, yes. Civil, civil matters. Those disputes are with private citizens. But the United States attorney represents the government, the federal government, and all agencies of the federal government. That right. opens all kinds of doors for issues relating to 
the claims or defenses of those agencies. How does it work? And how, what's the juxtaposition between the civil and criminal side of the practice? Okay, first, the juxtaposition is this. Most of our cases are criminal, mm. and, very few, and, and the rest are civil. And most of the cases that go to trial are the criminal cases. Very mm. few civil cases go to trial, as you know. Sure, they get settled, right. as in the state court. Right, exactly. Um, but our civil cases are very important, and uh, the case, civil cases that the office traditionally uh, does would be those cases where we defend federal programs, if that's the appropriate thing to do, um, defend against unwarranted claims against the U.S. Treasury, but recommend payment of meritorious claims. And of course, the bread and butter of what we do, which is to collect monies owed to the United States, whether it's the Internal Revenue Service, a student loan, or a um, uh, SBA uh, mm. loan. Whether there's money involved, or right. I guess enforcement of rules that's not criminal. Correct. Non-criminal enforcement right. of rules. Right. So, um, you know, this requires a certain amount of expertise, both the criminal side and, you know, in an unusual case, for example, the Wadia, Wadia case right. was unusual because right. there was, you know, technical things involved. But, uh, you know, I wonder, do you have all the expertise right here on these shores, right here downtown in the federal building? No, we don't. Or do need... you have to go somewhere else to get it? We can go somewhere else to get it. We're, all the U.S. Attorney's offices are part of the Department of Justice. And uh, it's, it's a huge department full of lawyers, more lawyers than anything else. And uh, they're very good at getting information out, sharing information. There are a lot of databases online now for any attorney uh, to go and look. And within the office, people are supervised uh, pretty closely, especially in the beginning, and certainly for uh, the sig more significant cases, even the U.S. attorney will want to get involved in what is going on uh, so that there's no problem. And uh, there is a lot of depth within the department. Mm. Uh, so um, I, I won't say that there's never a need to reinvent the wheel, because Ken Sorensen surely did need to do that <laughs> for that case. But in your um, certainly garden variety cases, even the more difficult ones, uh, there are places and people that you can go to, or we can refer you to them. Yeah. So you have resources. Absolutely. Do you customarily put more than one lawyer on a given uh, you know, case, or, or is it a kind of thing which you see um, in the state courts, you know, where the, the government is represented by just one person? Well, you know, the simplest garden variety, maybe drug cases, that might happen. But um, the trend for the past number of years has been to put at least two people on a case. And certainly if a case goes to trial, I always put two people on the case. Yeah. It's just better that way. Yeah, no, it's better, better to practice. It's yeah. a better quality of life, but it's also a better result, better right. quality of practice. Because right. you can bounce things off. Right. I always felt that way. Right. Yeah. So um, you are no longer the United States Attorney. Boy, that must have been a pretty spirited time for you to, oh, but I, I envy you that those years, you know, because you're really at the top of the legal pile when you do that. Um, how did you feel about it while you were doing it? Loved it. You know, I felt I was doing something that was um, meaningful, public service, uh, and I felt that I was doing that while being able to do the Department of Justice, Justice's mandate, which was to do justice. Yeah. And like you said earlier, um, while I was a U.S. attorney, I you know did not go to court to try cases. But as an AUSA, I went to court regularly. And I was so proud to say Florence Nakakuni for the United States. <sighs> yeah, I like that. There's nothing like that. Right. And you can't do that unless you do, in fact, represent the United right. States. Right, right. It doesn't work any right. other way. So you're not the U.S. attorney anymore. No. You're teaching at the law school, I know. I am. Uh, well, I just got done last semester. Okay, okay. Well, it's, it's, a, it's a good thing to do. And, and um, your career is different now. Um, and, you, you know, in another time, you would have been appointed again, right? It, it's political. You said before that this is a presidential decision. And, and doesn't that mean, honestly, doesn't that mean that if the president is appointing United States attorneys all over the country, it is a political decision? Oh, it certainly is. Um, but, you know, when we're told to get out last March, uh, the, the way it happened was sort of startling, but um, that was the, he, the president has the absolute right to remove U.S. attorneys at will. So, you know, nobody can quibble with that. Did he appoint somebody new? Uh, he has not, but the attorney general has appointed Kenji Price as the U.S. attorney on an interim basis. So there's, it's a statutory uh, appointment. I uh, can't name you the statute right now, but it's good for 120 days or until 
the presidential appointee is named. Mm. And at this point, everybody believes, and I believe that the nominee uh, will be Kenji Price. Mm. He was at this table sitting in that chair shortly after he joined Carl Smith. Really? Yeah, okay. no kidding. Yeah, but he he can't be with Carl Smith anymore. Oh, uh, no, he's not. <laughs> he's he's the United States attorney He now. certainly is. <laughs> so, you know, how, how does it affect things when you have, oh, kind of a... Um, an, an odd situation as we have in Washington right now and people are not being appointed on time. Uh, is this happening in other districts too where there's sort of a gap in the appointment? Uh, this administration doesn't regularly fill gaps for some reason. I haven't figured that out yet. Um, how does that affect the quality of the office and justice? Well, you know, I can tell you that uh, this go around, what the Attorney General did was appointed, I believe, 15 or 17 interim U.S. attorneys. And I have reason to believe that all of them, like Mr. Price, is expected to be the presidential nominee. What's and holding them up? I don't know. You'll have to ask them. <laughs> okay. uh, but um, I, I think there, there are things that an acting U.S. attorney cannot do, because prior to Mr. Price being named, Elliot Anoki was the acting U.S. attorney yeah. because there's another statute that says when a U.S. attorney uh, dies or can no longer is not, resigns or is no longer capable of doing the work, the first assistant U.S. attorney becomes the acting. So that was the authority for Mr. Anoki to be named acting, and he was acting for the past what nine months. But there are limitations on what someone who is acting can do. Uh, someone who is interim, I believe, might have more authority, uh, and so having someone there um, with that designated title, I think, brings more stability sure, to an office. Sure. But it's not the kind of stability that you would prefer. You would want the full tilt. Of to, course. If you could. Uh, right. And hopefully that'll come in the next three or four months. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, what does it mean, you know, to be a U.S. attorney? I, where I'm getting at is uh, in my day, which is ages ago, it was it was really a top, the top to be a, a United States attorney. And, and Kenji Price had experience. He was in the Eastern District of New York as a right, star right. Yes. U.S. attorney there. And, and uh, that, that defined his life, I think, as this has defined your life. If you are a U.S. attorney, it changes things. Mark Rechtenwald was a, an assistant U.S. attorney. Oh, yes, and now CJ. And now a, yeah, I mean, there is a connection with the bench. But, you know, how does it change you? And what is appealing about it? And why do people want that job? You know, what is appealing about it is... Uh, Given your position, you are the chief federal law enforcement officer for your jurisdiction. And so people look to you to set the tone uh, for all kinds of things, relationships between law enforcement and the community uh, and relationships between federal law enforcement and state and local law enforcement, which is really important these days. Uh, and also just being in the community as a standard bearer for federal law enforcement, because I, you know, I think w what the U.S. Attorney does in terms of conducting the office, the business of the office, and administering justice here uh, is, is something that the public looks to, and then based on that, they make decisions on what they think, you know, their perceptions of federal law enforcement, and maybe law enforcement in general. It's a lot of discretion there. Yes. Because the U.S. attorney is a person who decides whether or not a case gets charged. And that's way different than the state system. Because you are the senior federal law enforcement officer in the district. Right. This is something. It is. Because, and given that status, right, in, in matters before this, in law enforcement matters before the state, you represent the District of Hawaii, yeah. the federal side. In matters, in law enforcement matters on the federal side, you represent Hawaii, the District of Hawaii, and the interests of Hawaii and issues that deal with us when you're uh, before federal agencies or the Department of Justice in particular. Yeah. So would you, uh, would you advise a, a young graduate to try to make his way into the Department of Justice? And what, what would you suggest for his career path or her career path? Uh, I would absolutely recommend that. It's a great career. And uh, now there are some offices like the uh, District of Hawaii that historically has not hired people zero to one year out of law school because it's a pretty small office, mm. right? Uh, there are larger offices where uh, there's a revolving door of people who leave after five, six, seven years. I'm thinking of the Southern District of New York, probably Eastern District of New York, Los Angeles, huge districts where there are a couple of hundred lawyers or more. And so uh, it, 
it's easier to get into those bigger offices because there are no, more vacancies. Yeah. Uh, and you get very good training. You get to meet others similarly situated, hard, others hard at the same time as you. And for a young attorney, you'll be given a lot of responsibility uh, and uh, f for someone of your relatively inexperienced uh, uh, time in life, you know, but you yeah. get to do a lot of things. Yeah. And, and you're I, I giving think, up to say, I represent yeah. the United yes, States. Yes, yes. Yeah, so is it a career if you don't become the United States Attorney for that district? I mean, can you have a full career that way also? Absolutely. In fact, that's how I thought uh, my career would be. Um, after a while, it was pretty clear that I was going to be there for a while. Uh, and many people have made uh, the U.S. Attorney's Office a career, and it's a great career. Yeah. Because you're uh, doing something that is good. You know, you, you're told to do the right thing, you do the right thing. Sometimes the right thing might be you dismiss a case yeah. or you don't bring a charge. So uh, at the end of this administration, uh, and hoping, assuming for a moment we get back to a democratic administration at that time, um, and they called you and said, Florence, would you, would you please go back? <laughs> <laughs> would you resume, resume the job? No, what I, would you say? At that I think time? you don't go back. You don't go back. No, that you was don't my go question. back. Yeah, yeah. You don't go back. So where do you go forward? Well, there are lots of things to do in this community, and uh, you know, we'll see what happens. I mean, there are so many things that are going to happen this year, and uh, I'll have to decide, you know, where I want to um, put my energies. Yeah, but one thing is clear to me, anyway, is that. You know, maybe it was serendipitous, but you got that job, you held that job, you did well at that job, um, and it changed you. Even though, you know, but one thing I'll say, you're still a nice person, but, you know, it's not, that's not necessarily a test of the office. <laughs> uh, no. How, how did it change you? Well, it, it changed me this way. I um, realized that it was an important position and so that I had to do certain things, and I had to deal with different people um, in a consistent manner. Yeah. And as U.S. Attorney, you know, I always considered myself as having a number of constituencies, the people who work for you, yeah. the court, yeah. your so-called client agencies, the federal law enforcement agencies, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the state and local agencies, the community at large, um, your fellow U.S. attorneys across the country, and the Department of Justice. Very, two very different things. Yeah. Your colleagues and the department. Yeah. You could get to meet a lot of people that way. Oh, yes. It, it, was, it was a wonderful opportunity. And uh, the, the thing I really liked was letting other people know what the U.S. Attorney's Office did and showing up. You know, sometimes you just show up at these events, and uh, people appreciate that. Yeah, sure. It's a, it's a statement, uh, you know, senior law enforcement official in the, in the area. And um, more than that, more than that, it's more than that in the sense that, you know, we talk about the relationship of the citizen and the government. Mm -hmm. And the federal government is the preemptive government. Uh, it's, it's the one on top. And I mean, I, last time I looked. <laughs> and really, my thought is that, you know, we, we should be searching for that connection, to make that connection better and better, uh, to remain connected to citizen and the government. And the U.S. Attorney plays a major role in that connection. No, absolutely. In fact, um, uh, I can tell you that when I was U.S. Attorney, we're encouraged to go out into the community, community outreach, um, and just being part of the community. You know, we were told, look, it's not law enforcement and the community. You are law enforcement. You're part of the community. You have deep roots in your community. Every U.S. attorney does. Yeah. And uh, so for us, um, uh, when I was there, I worked very closely with the Honolulu Police Department only because they're here on the island and they are the big, biggest state law enforcement agency here. And they're the ones that have a community policing component, officers who are assigned to do just that. And so um, I worked a lot with them. and. Uh, but I have to tell you, Jay, the reason I was able to do that is because of something Steve Om did almost 20 years ago. He got a federally funded program called Weed and Seed here in Hawaii. And so it's through that program, which has been around for almost 20 years now, that uh, my predecessors and I, um, and, and I'm sure Mr. Price, uh, have used as a vehicle to do our community outreach. Yeah. 
uh, it, because it's hard to uh, do it just by yourself. Uh, so uh, there are programs uh, that emphasize um, crime prevention or personal uh, safety issues, and there are events yeah. um, where these matters are discussed. And for example, just during the holidays, typically the U.S. Attorney will get invited and attend uh, Shop with a Cop, Shop with a Kapuna, yeah, that sort of thing, which is a nice thing to do yeah. that yeah. involves law enforcement. Yeah. At the same time, though, I imagine now in these days, post your service as U.S. Attorney, when you read the paper about trials and federal crimes and cases, <coughs> you see it differently. You see it through the eyes of the Department of Justice as opposed to an ordinary person like me. You see yes. it You see it more clearly because you've been there. Right. So I'll go, okay, I think I know what's going to happen next. Right. Right. Well, thank you so much, Florence. It's great to have you down here. It's great to have this discussion with you. I hope you come back and talk to us maybe about some federal cases. Oh, that'd be great. Thanks, Thanks Jay. Enjoyed it. Thank Aloha. you. <laughs>